And I remember doing the night swim and like drifting off as a 10 year old, lying on one of those floaty mat things and looking up at the sky and having this like weird existential like moment to myself, 10 years old. I don't know if, right. if that happens to a lot of 10, maybe it does, maybe this is typical. So, but I had like this deep, like existential pondering moment, looking up at the sky, thinking about, wonder what else is out there. I wonder, is there somebody just like me looking up at the same sky, but looking down at me thinking the same thing. And like, what's our, what's the meaning? Why, why are humans human? And I had all these questions as a fucking 10 year old kid. So maybe that's normal. I don't know. Uh, it seems like kind of heavy for a 10 year old, but I remember having that moment and never really letting that go. And Brent Pella, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. I am so stoked for you to be here. Welcome. Let's, Hell yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me, bro. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to get started just kind of like with your story and your upbringing and your background, because a lot of people, at least in my circle and network, know who you are. And you're like the alien, spiritual, recovering bro, comedian guy. You know what I mean? And I used to say a lot with my awakening process and going from the toxic version of myself I was previously and joke that I'm a recovering bro. I don't really say that as much as anymore, but your videos, like they just, they, your style like speaks to me specifically. I love it so much. So thank you for being here. Hell yeah, dude. Thanks, man. I like, I like recovering bro. I use conscious bro. Yeah. That's what I always kind of use. That was actually, I was working on like some semblance of an album a couple of years ago and that was actually going to be the title. It might still be the day that that happens, but uh, yeah, the the whole conscious bro energy is definitely something that I live with, dude. So I'm glad that connects for you. Absolutely, yeah. Jordan um, Bowditch is that Bowditch? He was uh, Bowditch, yeah. Bowditch, yeah. He was on the podcast a while ago. He's the conscious yeah, he bro. Yeah, is the conscious yeah. bro. That's his entire brand. Yeah. He's yeah, it's too. it's so true. So, all right, let's start here because you know I actually thought you were part of the Austin tribe. I thought you're someone who's in Texas, Austin, all of that. And I, I think there was either a podcast or a video I watched recently. No, I think it was a podcast where you were mentioning how like you kind of tried Austin. You're like, no, I'm a California guy. And I remember 2020, you did a video with uh, JP Sears about all the Californians moving to Austin. So just to give people a glimpse of like who you are, what you're about and your upbringing, you just mentioned before we hit record, you're from, you grew up in Davis, California, right? Yep. Uh, originally from Davis, California. My mom brought me to many Grateful Dead shows when I was a baby. So whatever was flying around in the air back then it had some type of effect on me, I'm sure. Born and raised in Davis, school in California. I'm California by blood. Sankers, right? You want to Sankers? Santa Cruz first for two years and then Santa Barbara right after that for my last two years. So I kind of went beach hopping in college and then landed in uh, Venice, which is where I'm at now. And I love Texas. I love Austin. I love that whole scene, all the people there, the whole community there, but there's just something, I don't know what it is. I don't know. It might be fucking Stockholm syndrome. Maybe, I don't know. Something's keeping me in California. And I, I truly do love it here, even amidst the madness and, and some of the policies that are questionable and things like that. But yeah, started up in Davis and uh, just slowly made my way down the coast. My mom was awesome. She was a huge inspiration as far as me getting into comedy. You know, I, I grew up with a single mom, so we watched SNL all the time. Chris Farley, um, yeah, uh, when he was toward the tail end of his career before his death, she was showing me his movies. I was uh, really into SNL when Will Ferrell was huge. Mm -hmm. um, so all that mixed with my mom's kind of like, you know, new hippie personality <laughs> kind of was a, was a big inspiration for me. That's perfect. Yeah. I mean, Chris Farley's classic, like Black Sheep, Tommy Boy, and obviously yeah. all the SNL skits, uh, the motivational speaker down by the river, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then Will, Will Ferrell, oh man, that's just, yeah, <laughs> he's still he's still a legend. He's still pumping yeah. out yeah. good movies and everything. Well, that's really cool. I, one of the things I was curious about was like, if you had some sort of awakening or you had like a dark night soul that led you to spirituality, but it sounds like you're kind of like 
you grew up with it uh, because of going to the Grateful Dead shows and your mom's upbringing and everything else, right? So it's kind of always there with you. Yeah, I, I don't think I would pinpoint one specific moment for me, either high or low. I think it was more of an evolution over time because I didn't grow up religious. My family is Italian Catholic, but I, I was kind of the first to break that chain. Uh, my mom mm. raised me dependent of a certain specific religious like dogma. So I grew up uh, with kind of a couple different views from just different books and readings and things like that. Nothing major. And then, you know, mid 20s, as I was starting to get into comedy full time, well, not full time, but like more seriously, because I had a day job still, just the natural anxieties and tensions and self doubting that comes with trying to commit to something in the creative field boosted my uh, spiritual growth, I would say. Also, mm. some of the people that I started hanging out with were much more deeply involved in the conscious community, the transformational community. And uh, I started going to more events in my mid twenties. I had never been to a transformational festival until I was like 24. So that was a huge uh, pivot. And then I started meeting more people to the point where now I go to, you know, lightning in a bottle and I've run into friends every 10 minutes. Right. So it was definitely like a consistent conscious evolution um, with the intention of growing spiritually throughout the past couple of years. And one of the things for people that might not be familiar with your work or that I love about your videos is oftentimes in your videos, you have like a conflict and you have these like five minute YouTube videos and you put them on what Instagram, probably TikTok. They're everywhere, right? <laughs> Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So you guys can find it's all in the show notes. You can click it and you'll be able to connect with Brent and watch them. And I'll put a few specific ones that I'm talking about. And I just reached rewatched the one with JP Sears, who's a really big comedian, comedian, a lot of people know about. And this was a uh, probably summer of 2020. So it was like in the thick of the pandemic. And it's such a great video because you had the conflict of the California moving to the te to Texas and then, you know, like the labels and all this type of stuff. But then by the end, you have like a resolution. And there's this message I've noticed in a lot of your videos where like there is a conflict and it's like, hey, can't we just all get along essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, that was a running theme, dude, especially in 2020. You know, I, I never really stepped into the political world of content and comedy prior to 2020. I was just making fun of whatever was trending in the news or celebrity stuff or whatever. Uh, and then 2020 hit and changed a lot of people, changed how a lot of people right. thought. And for me personally, I stepped back from choosing specific sides and I started to, to create this perspective that saw the positives or negatives of each side. And I just tried to put that into um, a couple different videos that were based on topics, masks, uh, the vaccine mandate, somebody from a different state moving into your state. I think there were a couple other ones too. But yeah, it, it was a great way for me to not only like learn about both sides of whatever an issue is so that I could have a real appreciation for that issue and the people who are fighting for or against certain things, but it also allowed me to, to figure out how to put out messaging with the intention of bringing people together rather than putting out messaging with the intention of isolating one group and drawing one group in, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And there's a lot of craftsmanship and intention going into it. And I like that you brought up like learning what they're about. So I'm curious as not only a comedian, but a content creator, what is your approach and process to come to creating your content? Not necessarily like your, your standup uh, per se, but like just content in general, what you're putting out with your videos. What does that process look like? Um, usually I sacrifice a goat on a Tuesday. Afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and then, no, for videos, it's, it's totally different. Uh, and it, it varies a lot. Some videos are 100% improvised. We just have an idea. If it's like me and my friend, Nikki, we just shot a video a couple of weeks ago where we had zero scripts and we just went for it. And other stuff is like, I'll have an idea. I'll write it down in my notes. I'll write it down. I'll come home, put it on a postcard. I have a whiteboard I'm looking at right now that has three different columns in it. Write, edit, done. So the process is typically like finding something absurd or something that's happening in life, whether it's a character or 
like a certain type of behavior. Yeah. So we had uh, an idea for a video. It's not out yet, but we wanted to shoot a video about crystals and people who like love crystals. Right. Yeah. And we we've been watching a lot of uh, these vice mock documentaries, you know, those many ones. Yeah. And so we me this is me and my friend, Nikki Howard. We put together this idea for these two underground illegal crystal dealers. That's like the same as, you know, two people in Colombia dealing cocaine, but it's two people in LA dealing crystals to anybody who wants. So we put that together. We go back and forth, have a little writing session. And then on set, we typically get what's scripted just so that we have it. And then we'll go on a tangent and completely improvise. So it's definitely the, the way that I make content is very fluid mm-hmm. and it allows a lot of room for creative input and creative evolution of the story, as long as it's within the boundaries of what we're trying to land on at the end. That makes sense. And I'm sure it's extremely helpful that you're both comedians too. So you can kind of uh, riff off each other and improvise, yeah. like you said, That that's great. So I'm going to put a link so you guys can check that out. The recent videos Brent's done with uh, Nikki. I know there's one you did with you guys being cyclists. Another one that was hysteric. That one was great. Another one that all my friends and I were just sending to each other. It was so good. And basically the two of you guys were just like making fun of each other for how would you put it? I'll let you explain the video. Which one, which one was this? Uh, Being like two woo. Like you're like, yeah. uh, The one with um, like, uh, you got that shirt from mother ayahuasca or this right, or that, right. all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, so we went to lightning in a bottle this year and we, we shot four videos in a day. It was crazy. It was like an eight or nine hour day in the 105 degree heat. And one of them was we both played vendors who were selling huh. little like spiritual knickknacks and like conscious trinkets and, you know, a little thing, a sage or like a rock or a moonstone or whatever. And that one was fun too, because even there we got to land on a resolution. So it was similar to the other ones too, where, you know, it's at the end of the day, the message is like, Hey, why are we fighting with each other? We're all the same. But uh, for that one specifically, it was fun because I just got to mock all me, myself and all of my friends, because as soon as we were done shooting that video, I went to go change and I changed into like a kimono and, you know, a scarf with the Pisces symbol on it. So I was like, I am, this guy, I am that person, you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Self-deprecating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, and the other uh, videos that you've been doing recently, Top Gun and though just your take on Tom Cruise and Top Gun is awesome. And if anyone, just for people that haven't either heard you talk about on your podcast or your videos, I was listening. I think it was your podcast recently where you were talking about like, I don't even care that he's Scientologist. Like he's yeah. just, he's the man just going, can you share a little bit of that riff? <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> I put that in a video too. The video is uh, how bros talk about inflation. Yeah. And uh, it's just like, <laughs> that was an improvised line too. You know, that was just so in the moment, but the Top Gun stuff was fun because Tom Cruise is a fucking legend, dude. He he's a, he, an incredible actor. He's never made a bad movie. Well, he might have, but all his movies are like fun. Like they're big and they're fun and they make you completely forget that he's done some weird shit because of Scientology. He's done some weird shit and he's like had a weird effect on a lot of people because Scientology is so weird. Mm-hmm. But you don't think about that when he's going Mach 10 in a Navy jet. And I think that's pretty cool. And I think that speaks to, you know, how hard Tom works is that, you know, he doesn't make you think about the Thetans until he's trying to get you in the church. Otherwise it's all good. And it's Top Gun time, you know? Absolutely. And I I will say recently I rewatched Vanilla Sky. Have you seen that one? No, not in a long time. Oh man. That movie is epic it is so good because one of the things at least with me i'm so into spirituality and what is this human existence right and how all of our live quote unquote parallel lives really are being played out at the same time and the movie vanilla sky is probably from the early 2000s or late 90s and it's basically being in a dream in a dream state and there's a lot of these movies coming out these days actually i would like to kind of transition that thought to this in terms of uh 
programming, right? Like I'm sure you've seen the documentary out of, uh, out of shadows, not out of the shadows. Remember that one in 2020? It's exactly. you, you can't find it now. It's on like the shoot. Um, it was shadow band, but a sense essentially for you and anyone listening, there's amazing film called out of shadows, which I can put that in the show notes because it's hard to find shadow band. Yeah. So it was about the stunt double who really uncovered CIA documents about how the government is programming and conditioning society. And they're like in cahoots and working with Hollywood to program people. And basically like the movie Zoolander where they are brainwashing Derek Zoolander and doing yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. And, and you see that and you're like, oh, this could never happen. That's so ridiculous, but that's exactly what's happening. And what's been so fascinating for me recently, and it all started with the movie Soul. Of course, there's movies that we could look back to over the years, but really when Pixar's movie Soul came out on Christmas Day in 2020, that's when I started to be like, huh, this is interesting that there there's now starting to be some narratives that are helping people, right? Especially when you look at Pixar and Disney, because it seems kind of weird, like to be a little of the quote unquote conspiracy theorist, thought manipulation, what, whatever someone wants to label it as traditionally, we would think of like big Hollywood movies about keeping people in a limited state. So just opening up this topic to see anything that might come up for you. Yeah. What, so what did you, I'm curious what you saw in the movie soul. You, you saw that as a good thing, right? I saw it's, it was a good thing because that. yeah, yeah. I actually did a 60 minute breakdown of it on YouTube. And it's funny because my YouTube, like it, it's just my podcast and I get like maybe two to five views per video. That's it. But that specific video where I did the breakdown of the movie soul right now, it's at like 25,000 views or something. And mm -hmm. it, I don't say it's to pump my own ego because, I mean, these are small numbers in comparison to a lot of people. But what's interesting is I have a couple hundred likes and no dislikes. So it, I do feel like that's my most like my best work. And what I did was take each, not each scene, but basically break down like the hidden spirituality. And to me, most of the the conditioning and programming of society is to keep you in a limited state to keep you in like that corporate job or keep you not feeling enough but the whole movie and it's not a spoiler but if you really want to pause the podcast and come back after you watch it you're not it's not really a spoiler but the whole movie is about really that feeling of when you chase something and then you get there and you go oh i thought i would feel different and then you start to bring ground yourself into presence and it's about being in the moment and that is the message that we all need you know yeah i agree 100 percent. and uh it's it's interesting to be kind of like a part of the hollywood world right now and also look at it from an outsider's perspective I'll give you a couple examples because I, I have seen over the years, not the best messaging coming through with TV and movies. And mm -hmm. I agree with you that things like soul or even the movie, it just came out everything everywhere all at once. Oh yeah. Uh, did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, incredible. So, but even that had like a brilliant message tied into it. Right. And it, mm -hmm. it was centered around this character who uh, we were made to feel very sad for because she was like bad at everything and not following her dreams. And then mm -hmm. it got to a very positive resolution. And I felt inspired after watching it too, to be Boy. happier in my moments. So I see all that. And I also, at the same time, you know, I, I, I started independently with no manager, no agent, no ties to like mainstream Hollywood. And now I'm currently a cast member on one of the biggest comedy shows in entertainment, Wild and Out. It's it's, it's it's amazing. It's like I think second to Saturday Night Live, maybe, but they do better numbers online. So, and and I'm I'm in that. Like I see how that show works, and I love that show because they don't do weird shit. They just straight up put stuff on TV that they think is funny, and there's no like <laughs> messaging or anything. I remember when I first got the show. Uh, I had been doing videos throughout 2020, making fun of like conspiracies or whatever. And I got a bunch of messages like, wow, okay, sold your soul, huh? Wow, dude, you're in the belly of the beast now. You're going to get the mark of the beast tattoo too? Wow, RIP Brent, RIP Brent, dude. And I was like, what are you talking about? People, people latch on to an idea that 
um, you know, is it, very extreme. The idea, and for, in this example, it's Hollywood. It has not does not have your best interests in mind and wants to manipulate and wants to da 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 and wants to paint a narrative. And here I am on a mainstream TV show that literally just wants to be funny. And I'm in the, and I see how it works from beginning to end. And I'm a part of it and I'm writing jokes on it and I see what makes it and why. And um, so I think, yes, you know, in, in a big way over the years, Hollywood has not championed what's the best way to phrase it. I don't know, positive sense of your spiritual self, something mm -hmm. like that. Right. They have not, that's not been a main message. It's been a lot of like, there's a lot of darkness, you know, look mm -hmm. at Travis Scott, right. When he did his concert and people actually died. And to me, I think that was um, part of his branding and his messaging was very dark and negative and aggressive. And there's just a lot of that. There's a lot of that in Hollywood, but at the same time, um, it's almost easier to focus on that than it is to focus on the positives uh, and, and I don't mm. know why that is. It's almost like how the news is always telling you that something bad is happening and rarely reports good things. And that's because something, something human psychology is more attracted to something, something, you know, I don't have the specific verbiage, to, right. to describe that. but yeah, at the end of the day, I, I agree. I do see a lot more uh, positive messaging that's getting integrated and, and folded into entertainment. And I also recognize the, the negativity, but I don't, I don't know that I believe that there's one bigger conspiracy of any kind to like actively hold people down. I think that's more of a thing that's happened naturally because of capitalism, classism, and, and people that are so fucking desperate for power. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The thing that comes up for me and the part that I get a little stuck on and a little confused is like, look at a movie like Field of Dreams, classic film from probably 90s, you know, so long time ago. And there we could go on and on uh, finding all these movies that have positive messages that show connection, connection with the spiritual world. And it's there to actually help people if they can see through just the face value of it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that there's both, right? Because there are yeah. the positive and there's also the the kind of conditioning to keep you more in a limited state or whatever it might be like Mars attacks, right? Which feeds into another topic I want to talk with you, but Mars attacks being one where, or Independence Day, any signs, any of these videos where aliens are bad and how many people think aliens are scary. And if they really think about it, like I know for me, one of my first rabbit holes, my first rabbit hole was the human origin story and really extraterrestrials. And that what well, that was a huge one in my spirituality. And it was just like, why on earth would they be bad? Why would you actually think that they were bad? That doesn't make any sense. And obviously it's so clear it's because of our conditioning through the movies and everything else, you know? Yeah, I think that and the conditioning about drugs, I think are the yes. two two of the biggest things that uh, there, there has been a conscious conditioning effort by, I don't you say whoever, Hollywood, the government, da, 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 pick right. your group. Right. But yeah, both of those things, uh, drugs in particular, and I'm a big proponent for do whatever you want to do with your own brain and body. As long as it doesn't harm other people, you want to go smoke an ounce of meth? Go for it. Oh, geez. <laughs> lock, yourself in, lock yourself in a bedroom. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if that's what you choose to do, why, why would I care? Right? I don't Fair. think you should. But right. obviously, that's an extreme example. But going all the way back to uh, the war on drugs and how from mm -hmm. then on, we was looked at as like a, a, like a drug. Like, oh, my God, he's on drugs. He's on dope. He's on smack. That was weed in the 80s. That's mm -hmm. what they called it in, in movies and things like that. And, and we are just now finally starting to move out of the place where content is stigmatizing drugs and, and psychedelics. And I love that. And then as far as the alien stuff goes, that's yeah. like my favorite topic because, yeah, there's been a wild conditioning effort and a wild effort to make people think one thing or another about aliens uh, ever since the 50s and the 60s, right? 
Yeah. What? What did you ask something? Because I could. I could oh just no! Talk. I, I, I oh, would no. love to hear you just talk about aliens, the inspiration for your videos, <laughs> your fascination, your curiosity, and yeah. um, fun facts. Anything that comes up. <laughs> so yeah, dude. I, uh, you know, it's it's one of my favorite topics because it's so, it's it it so speaks to like the human condition because it it speaks to the question of are we alone. Mm-hmm. I don't think we are at all. There's got to, anybody who thinks humans are the only life or even the only intelligent life is just absolutely ignorant of how unfathomably big the entire universe is, right? Even just the galaxy is big. So I I took uh the inspiration for a couple of those alien videos that me and my buddy Blake Weber did where we're in the blue makeup yeah. and everything like that. And those were some of the most fun pieces you could sell those as costumes, dude. Yeah, we're trying to pitch it as a TV show right now. So That's hopefully, amazing traction on that. Yeah, and if anybody has you know fifty grand and you want to fund a pilot, you e- email me immediately. I wrote that series from the beginning based on the idea that these aliens could be like a uh, uh, a perspective. They could provide a point of view that is removed from the tribalism of like human nature, right? Mm -hmm. So they could speak to things like politics or current events without defaulting to one side or the other, because they could actually see these things from a completely disconnected point of view. And I thought that was really interesting. So that's why in the uh, Joe Rogan talks to an alien video, the alien is like, well, libertarianism is the only answer. Because that's the closest you can really get into in modern politics to some semblance of a middle ground. But yeah, the the alien stuff that's out right now, you know, I if I had one wish in my life, it it would be to have aliens emerge at some point yeah. while I'm still living. That's all that's literally all I want. That would make I would I could fail at everything, but if I had empirical evidence that aliens existed, I'm dying a happy man. So yeah, I I love the topic. I think uh, it's infinitely deep as far as things you could talk about regarding aliens and regarding extraterrestrial life coming mm-hmm. to this planet or us finding extraterrestrials. Uh, but I I really enjoy focusing on like what their perspective would be toward humankind, and that's what I try to put in those videos. That's why every couple minutes in that documentary piece, the, the guys are like, "Dude, you guys are so dumb." People are so dumb. Yeah. You guys, you guys invented money? What? So dumb, dude. So dumb. You know what I mean? And, um, but yeah, it's, uh, th- those pieces are fun and takes a lot of inspiration from, you know, these crazy documents that are getting released and, and the conversation that right. is still one of the most popular to have. It's interesting hearing you say that you're uh, developing a show for for the aliens because it makes me think of the SNL skit of the Californians because you're also known for like your Californian stuff and you sell you have a merch shop um, on your website, Californian shirts, all that type of stuff. And I actually don't think maybe it's because I am Californian, never lived anywhere outside of the state, but I don't think that shows that funny <laughs> or that skit, I should say, on SNL. But I could see the alien uh, show being whether it's a skit on something, its own show or a movie. I think that's a fantastic idea. That's absolutely brilliant. And what I wanted to ask you was, have you had a firsthand alien encounter like through medicine or UFO or uh, just anything at all? No, you know, I wish I could say yes, because that would sound super cool. But right. uh, I have not. I went to Sedona. Uh, me and my girlfriend went to Sedona together a while back. And we went on a UFO tour. Well, we had a guide. And the guide gave us military grade night vision goggles, right? And this is Sedona. So it's very clear skies. There's also allegedly a lot of alien activity because right. of the vortex, vortices, whatever. And we're out there. You know, and the guide is, is she's already kind of planting information in our minds that would allow us to think we're seeing a UFO. So she's, she's given all kinds of info about like the night sky, uh, how to tell if something is a plane or a satellite or a UFO, 
And UFO doesn't necessarily mean alien ship, right? It just means an mm -hmm. object that's flying that you can't identify. So she's telling us these things and we're looking with our night vision goggles up at the night sky and I'm seeing things move and they look like they're moving in, in a way that a satellite would move. And then we saw one thing move like a satellite, but then it started speeding up and it took off. And she was like, Oh, that's them. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's them. There's a, you know, we, we think this is kind of an interstellar highway up here with a couple different portals. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that was definitely them. How I, I, I would love to believe, Oh my yeah. God, I would love to believe, yeah. but I, I just, I can't let myself freak out at a tiny speck of light that looks like it might've started moving faster and then disappeared. I, I I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah. But yeah. that's about the, the most that I've seen. I wish it was more, <laughs> you know, maybe on my first ayahuasca adventure in, in a couple of weeks, it'll be uh, oh, a couple of weeks. Uh, Different. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm setting it up right now with some friends. But beautiful. Um, you know, I, I haven't yet. I have not had that had a any type of encounter with a being or a creature. Definitely with different, you know, levels of energy and and frequencies that mm -hmm. you can feel when, when you've taken a certain amount of medicine or you are doing a practice like breath work or anything like that. But never like an interaction with like a being or, mm -hmm. or an entity of any kind. Well, I'd love to do another pod with you after your ayahuasca experience and sure. uh, kind of yeah. compare and contrast before the the before and after, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's it's so interesting because I'm I'm very much in the same boat as you. I've had several, quite a few UFO type sightings. Um, one that was really massive. The other were smaller and you couldn't really confirm kind of like what you're talking about. And for over a year, like every night, almost every night, I like I, I started a prayer routine and connecting with my guides, that type of stuff. And part of that was just to make contact, actual contact. And I haven't had anything either. And what I will say is I work with this uh, Chandler. She's very well respected. She's actually asked down to Mary Margrave. She's one of the people I work with. And in a call a few years ago, she said something like how I didn't tell her about how I used to contact. Uh, I was like in communication with ETs all the time and I would see their ships and all this type of stuff. And I don't remember my childhood yet I do have a lot of synchronicities. And one of those is like, uh, my dad will kind of joke, play, make fun of me a little bit these days. Like how, when I was a kid, I would say, you're not my real dad. I'm from the planet Zotar and all this stuff about being an alien. And I don't remember any of that at all. And the biggest thing was a couple of years ago on the way to fit for service summit, there were fires uh, where I live in Santa Cruz. I grew up in Gilroy, which is about an hour away parents still live in the house I grew up in. So they were potentially going to have to evacuate as well. So I was driving a Tahoe for a fit for service summit. This was July, 2020. And my dad sent me a picture of a necklace and it was a necklace that had a blue alien on it. And he goes, Hey, I found this in your little kid stuff. And I go, Oh, interesting. That makes sense. I don't remember that, but that makes sense. It's weird. It's blue. Okay. And then the next day was the first day of the summit. And one of my now really good friends, but at the time we didn't really know each other. And she was just kind of tapping into her own channeling. And she comes to me and she goes, Hey, I got a channel message for you. Uh, you want? I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. She goes, Oh, you're not from this planet. <laughs> I go, okay. Yeah. I know that. And it was funny. Cause it was like, huh? Well, that's weird. Cause just yesterday I, my dad sent me this picture of this alien necklace so then that night, another friend goes, hey, you said the channelers are saying you're an Arcturian, right? Because this is a whole nother thing, but I've had a lot of different channelers without me asking, they'd be like, oh, you have heavy Arcturian energy or whatever. Yeah, that's wild. So check this out. So then she goes, let's, let's Google image what their Arcturians look like. And they're blue. 
and they have the same shape head and like eyes as this necklace. And the weirdest thing to me is like for a little kid necklace, like most alien stuff where you're going to see, it's going to be the typical like green or maybe gray. So the fact that it was blue. So you line all those up and there's been so many other synchronicities like that. And so I'm curious, like, are you having those experiences that are kind of like those winks versus like how you and I both want like that big one, but are you getting the subtle nods? Sure. Yeah, that's a fantastic question and a wild uh, story. Thank you for sharing that. That's so crazy. Um, For me, I haven't gotten synchronicities in that way, but there I've I've had more so like things that kind of break my understanding of of reality in a way. Um, So I I I think I've met a couple other people who have had similar things to this. And I swear to God, this is true. It's going to sound like some crazy, you know, psychic shit. But things have happened that I've dreamed about previously. Yeah. And I think that's really weird. Like a conversation with somebody that I'm meeting for the first time, I'll have dreamt about that exact conversation in that location, whatever cafe, restaurant, bar, nightclub. I'll have dreamt about that like two weeks prior. And I'll remember the dream. Cause some, and sometimes I even write the dream down after I have it. If it's a really clear dream and I wake up and I can remember it, I'll write the dream down. And then sometimes that exact dream will happen. What that is, I have no idea. Am I psychic? Probably not. But that it, there's something happening with time and space and reality that I think allows people to jump from time to time or tap in mm-hmm. from time to time. Other slight synchronicities that is fascinating uh, it, it's it's really weird to be honest it it's like and i don't know like what to do with that information because have, it's right fair have you connected with eric godsey no mm-mm. you know who he is i've heard the name yeah so he's um i think he's now like ceo of aubrey marcus's brand uh he's pretty much like Aubrey, Aubrey's brought him up under his wing and he's an incredible mind and philosopher and just so smart Jungian philosopher. And I've, uh, worked with him through fit for service the past couple of years. And earlier this year did what they called the full temple reset. And it was a five day fast. And so during those times of not eating, he would talk to us about dreams. And I've been hearing him talk about dreams for the past couple of years, but it was a smaller container and just a little bit more about dreams. And I forget exactly what it's called, but that's one of the style of dreams. And yeah, I'll find some info and I can send it to you and also put in the show notes so for anyone else so that they can dive a little bit deeper on it because it is really fascinating. And I have one of my really good friends has that all the time, like yeah. all the time. It's weird, dude. And, you know, if, if I had to guess, if I had to just venture a wild guess, I'd say it's, you know, our consciousness is tapped into something else. You know, I I, I do love the metaphor that some folks give of your brain being like a a receiver and it's transmitting to some higher form of uh, conscious energy. So uh, yeah, but that, that in itself has always been a little bit weird. And outside of that, you know, I remember being 10 years old and I was at, uh, I was going to school in Sacramento, California. It was a school called Mary Hills, a private school for elementary school. And we had a pool at the school because we would do swimming lessons and things like that. And it only went up through fifth grade. So on the night of our fifth grade graduation, all the fifth graders would sleep over. It would be, we would have a sleep in at school and we would do a night swim. And I remember doing the night swim and like drifting off as a 10 year old, lying on one of those floaty mat things and looking up at the sky and having this like weird existential like moment to myself, 10 years old. I don't know if, right. if that happens to a lot of 10. Maybe it does. Maybe this is typical. To, but I had like this deep, like existential pondering moment, looking up at the sky, thinking about, you know, I wonder what else is out there. I wonder if, uh, you know, is there somebody just like me looking up at the same sky, but looking down at me thinking the same thing. Maybe there's a lizard boy with a tail on a different <laughs> planet somewhere out there. Lizard boy, Brent looking up straight at the sky. And then, you know, it's the reverse and they're just looking at each other from across galaxies. And like, what's our, what's the meaning? Why, why are humans human? And I had all these questions as a fucking 10 year old kid. 
So maybe that's normal. I don't know. Uh, it seems like kind of heavy for a 10 year old. Uh, but I remember having that moment and never really letting that go. And that's always been kind of a consistent energy that I have in me at all times. It comes out a lot in videos, especially existential videos, like some of those alien videos, or, you know, even I, I mix it in here and there, you'll see a lot of like psychedelic inspired jokes or psychedelic inspired editing, where it just feels like you're watching the video and it turns into a DMT trip in a way. So yeah. I, I love doing that. And that all kind of stems from this deeply rooted curiosity about space, time, the universe and the human experience that I was having when I was 10. And I like that. I love it. Still trying to answer those questions for 10 year old Brent. And I think I will always be trying to do that. And it's, um, it's fun that that like that yeah. in itself is a is a really fun type of questioning energy to be carrying around. I agree. And I'm stoked for your ayahuasca experience here in a few weeks, because that definitely these things start to click not all the time. But you know, I don't remember my childhood, like I said earlier, but I do remember coming home from Sunday school and my dad was working on his lawnmower and I go, dad, if God created us, who created God? And that was kind of my anchor story, kind of similar to yours. And I do remember I was thinking that way. And the only thing that comes up for me is like, I think that's a certain extent normal for kids in terms of they're not washed with all the conditioning of everything else. So they're open vessel and channel but also in the belief of star seeds and things like that. Like I would, this whole star th seed thing is a whole nother conversation because if time doesn't exist and we're playing out all our different lives, our parallel lives at the same time, and we believe in this process of going through earth of the earth school and ascending and ultimately getting off this planet, well, then every soul here would be an ET. Whether the, to me, the difference is, okay, was your very first incarnation on earth or was it on another planet? I think that might be the difference. You know what I mean? Yeah. But basically saying like, I think if I were to just guess, I, it's because people like you and I that have these type of experiences and a lot of the listeners of a podcast like this, it's because our first incarnation was off this planet, right? Cool. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, it's in it's definitely interesting. Uh, one thing I wanted to go back to too was you were talking about being a transmitter, like uh, for consciousness and the brain and that type of stuff. Have you done the rabbit hole of Nikola Tesla? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. It. Yeah, he was into some cool shit. I really wish we could see everything that he did because he was getting into some wild stuff, and I think he was onto it. I mean, he, he was, you know, he he. What what was the bigger project that he was trying to do? He was trying to figure out a way to have free energy essentially energy that could cover the globe, mm -hmm. right? And not be reliant on any type of like fuel mechanism. He was going to tap the energy out of air or something like that. I, I don't know all the specifics, but yeah, uh, exactly. And then they shut it down because then they couldn't make money off it. That's my understanding. Right, but right, right. The yeah. interesting thing is recently the FBI or CIA I always get them confused for whatever reason, but one of them released documents that he was an alien from Venus. He was a Venusian alien. Did you know about that? Uh, were those real documents? I mean, it's hard to tell with any of this stuff, right? It, that's they were a, saying he's a Venetian. That's some, That's like a wild thing for a government agency to say. I did see, here's here's my thing with released documents, because I've read a lot of the mm -hmm. ones that have been released, right? Uh, yes, the Pentagon released the footage of the UFO and the CIA or whatever released the documents about MK Ultra, mm -hmm. And they released documents about people being like energy beings did you see that one on it was, netflix the like kind of astral uh projecting uh, one? i think I, I know what you're talking about yeah, yeah there was something on netflix but they released like documents about how people were like actual like you could control people's energy and, and people could manipulate the energy around them and we're all like made of a certain amount of energy it, it was very spiritual for the cia or whatever to release but then when it gets to something like a government agency saying that, you know, somebody is Venetian, uh, that's, I, I wouldn't trust that <laughs> just because yeah. if that was real, the world should be up in arms about that. I mean, that's, 
absolute proof that they're aliens. And I don't think you could make something like that, you know, not big news. So I don't know that I would believe that. But I do think that they are hiding way more than the amount that they put out. Like there is a ridiculous amount of secrecy and compartmentalization for all kinds of these secret projects. Even the um, the the UFO footage that they released about where where it actually shows whatever that craft is moving in ways that don't follow our known laws of physics. That's wild because that's mm-hmm. either something not from this planet, something not from this dimension, or some government has figured out how to break the laws of physics. Any of those are like absolutely terrifying, mind blowing possibilities. Right. So yeah, I think they're, they're hiding like a ton and they've been, yeah. they've been trying to hide stuff like Tesla stuff. Dr. Stephen Greer's work is really fascinating. And one thing yeah. he's been talking about the past couple of years is about like the release of this information is a false flag and it's going to be more fear mongering. And the idea is to, this is my understanding of what he's saying essentially, but to release it now so that we start to be like, oh, they are real. But then the next phase would be to be afraid of them. Mm, that's right. interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you know, fear is is just such a powerful tool that I don't doubt that. But at the same time, it's a, to me, it's either aliens or the government. I think those are the only two options. It's ne- it's definitely not like a public citizen or even a private citizen doing any type of secret science project. 100%. I like to imagine that it's uh, something not man made, just because the stories surrounding all that stuff have been so fucking weird. Like the uh, Tic Tac story um, right. out off the coast of San Diego that was moving all weird over the surface of the water. The stories about those gimbals that fly up on the East Coast and, and approach the U.S. armed forces and their aircrafts. And the amount of pilots that have no idea what those things are mm-hmm. make me think that it can't be the government. But at the same time, the government's fucking shady, dude. So who knows? As I, I don't, I, I would say ahead of Stephen Greer's thing i would say i believe that uh if it is aliens then they would be trickling this information out slowly right yeah because if it's if if, so what he says is that um the government is slowly trickling out information does he believe that they're actually that these are extraterrestrial extraterrestrial crafts or does he think that the government is putting out fake information about fake crafts i can't yeah i can't confidently answer on what he believes just to make that clear for everyone listening but my understanding of what he's saying is yes ufos do exist i mean that's what he's known for is c5 meditation to make contact in his events however i think what he's saying is be use a lot of discernment and tap into your own intuition of what you're hearing in the news because not all of them are actual ufos and they're they're essentially government whatever i'm not sure exactly what he believes but i would imagine that it could potentially be cgi or whatever it is Uh, i'm not sure but i think he is saying that like some of them are fake essentially yeah but so if anyone's I, interested, do a deep dive on Stephen Greer's work. You know, yeah, yeah. If, if it is, if it is aliens, they would have killed us by now. So yeah, exactly. That, if they're uh, they, threatening, they are friendly for yeah. sure. They're either friendly or they don't. They're not, they don't give a shit. They're pro, they're either friendly or they're completely indifferent, right? Because if they right. were hostile, they would have wiped us out years ago. But like that, any any creature that can travel from or life that can travel from a different planet or a different dimension or galaxy or whatever would be able to like set the planet on fire in a heartbeat. So I think I, for that reason, I don't think that they would be uh, hostile if they are here. And that makes me think, okay, if, if we're slowly getting pieces of information and it's getting trickled out slowly, uh, but surely then maybe that's their way of, yeah. Conditioning us to understand that they're real. Cause if they all came out at once and said, yo, we're here the world would jump into a panic. It would be crazy. It would be a free for all, right? It'd be like the beginning of COVID when people were grabbing toilet paper and beating each other up for paper towels at mm-hmm. aisle seven at Walmart, right? So if they are real, 
then I think it's a good thing that we're getting it piecemeal because if they just came out and said, what's good, that would yeah. be pretty panicking. I would like that. That's what I want. I want yeah. them to just come out and say, what's up. But I think for the vast majority of people, uh, that would probably not be a good thing. And the government probably knows that too. So if mm-hmm. they are real, then it's a good thing. I think that we're getting it piece by piece for the agreed a hundred percent. And I think that's why people like you and I as well, that uh, have somewhat of a connection to them as well. And uh, are calling it in, aren't having these experiences while, you know, I can't speak to your friends, but I know my other friends are at least some of them. And I'm like, well, what about me? It's like, well, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So totally. So, Dolores Cannon, have you checked out her work? Dolores Cannon, she wrote like 17 books. Um, I uh, know her for her work specifically, the three waves of volunteers. And it's basically about extraterrestrials incarnating as humans, star seeds to save the earth. And the idea is now this is like where it gets really woo and wacky and, you know, stuff that I believe that a lot of people won't, but ETs created the human race, right? And part yeah. of that whole thing is that they cannot intercept and save us from ourselves. So when the atomic bomb went off, uh, what she talks about is how they came up with this plan. Okay, well, since we can't actually like come in our spaceships and be like, you idiots, like your videos, essentially, like, let me save you, right? Uh, We have to come up with a plan. So then the ETs are incarnating as humans, star seeds, light workers, healers, whatever you want to call them. And that from the inside were saving the human species essentially that's more or less the concept saving the human species from itself from from ourselves from destroying ourselves Mm, that's interesting yeah i mean that that plays also with the um stories of uh ufos showing up around naval bases and and nuclear Mm -hmm. plants right i like that i like that a lot i mean there you know if if there are good uh life forms out there then there are certainly bad ones too you know what i mean uh so the idea is uh an extraterrestrial would populate the human race that would like integrate within the human race yeah it's what star seeds are essentially you know like we've already ascended past earth but we're coming here on a volunteer mission i love that how do we how that's the thing how do we meet them how do we find out yeah what do we see? Do we see somebody walking down the street that's just made of light? I would love that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, even just people doing it. What's what's tough for me about that is like I just I want to see it because there's yeah. there's a lot of people that do really amazing work to help humanity to push humankind forward. And from the top down, you know, Tony Robbins all the way down through mm-hmm. your local person that works at the homeless rehab shelter oh, for true. free, you know, and I would call those people light beings, people that have that are dedicating themselves to propelling the human experience further on the positive uh, side of things. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And I think at the same time, there's a lot of people that aren't doing that, that are kind of yeah. the fucking of that you know uh most of them are politicians <laughs> and, yeah. uh so maybe we have a lot of star seeds coming through to try and create that balance i believe that 100 percent that could happen absolutely Awesome. Well, we're running short on time. So I have one last question for you as it relates to ETs, then I'll we'll switch topics real quick. This question is do you think Maverick has ever seen a UFO? And what would happen if he did? Dude, I think the real question is, has a UFO ever been lucky enough to see Maverick, dude? Oh! Oh, ever been lucky enough to get a glimpse of Maverick? Because if a UFO was cruising around and they saw Tom Cruise, they would be like, holy shit, tell the planet. Tell our entire planet what I just (laughs) saw. And no one would believe. They'd be like, what? Tom Cruise? That guy doesn't exist. That's crazy. So so That's great. So maybe that's your next video, uh, Aliens and and Maverick. (laughs) An alien, an alien <laughs> spots Tom Cruise flying around. Right, uh, yeah. he had to have seen a UFO for sure. Yeah, and absolutely. You know what's crazy is he probably would have tried to fly it. You know. 
Yeah, 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 true. All right, cool. So tell us about Vibe Rosé as we start to wrap this up, because you have so many projects from your Wild It Out, uh, being a comedian, managing your merch shop, and I don't even know what else. And now you have a startup as well, uh, Game yeah. the Wine Biz. Yeah, dude. So um, Vibe Rosé, that's V-Y-B Rosé, was an idea of mine uh, dating all the way back to 2020 when we were in a uh, good old lockdown out here in California for those first couple of months, you know, those first two months, uh, we didn't really know what the hell was going on. We stayed indoors in California because we were told to do. And then slowly we were like, what the fuck? This is stupid. So we went back out to join society. But during those lockdown times, we were, I was drinking mad amounts of wine. I became a little wine nerd. I had to have some hobbies in addition to shooting content. And I was making homemade pasta, which you know, my family raised me in the kitchen. I'm Italian. So pasta sauce runs in my blood and the rosé, it became kind of a business idea when, uh, you know, it hit late 2020, early 2021. And I felt like I wanted to do something more. I like, I wanted, I wanted a new way of being creative and I wanted a new way of trying to put some joy energy into somebody's life. And Rosé, uh, not only do I love Rosé, but I also think that Rosé is the drink that you have when you're happy. Like I've never seen mm. somebody sad drinking Rosé. If you're going to be sad, you're going to reach for a Cabernet or something else. You know what I mean? <laughs> but people that are drinking Rosé are just like, they're always happy. That's just the branding of what that product is. Mm. And I just, I, I wanted to put something else into the world that could be a catalyst for connection and and joy and you know, a lot of people, a lot of my friends do not drink. And I know we're in a phase right now in society where a lot of people are like quitting drinking because they're watching out for their health. And that's fine. But a glass of rosé to me is great. It's a, it's a, it's a lubricator for conversation, for mm -hmm. connection, for happiness, joy, smiles and laughs, dude, all, all of that. And I feel really, really passionately about putting as many of those things out into the world as I possibly can during my time here to just try and lift literally the vibration of humanity as much as I can. And so that's why, why we called it vibe. Um, so it's out now you can order it in uh, California, New York, Texas, Florida, Arizona at vibrose.com. Use vibrate as a promo code to save on shipping. That's with a Y and uh, yeah, dude, I got to send you some bottles too. It's, yeah, um, yeah, it's been gonna, a fun journey. How? Uh, Cause I'm going to, Tahoe, I think in two days, uh, not that this is relevant to the listeners or the podcast or anything else, but how long does it usually take to ship? I could send it to Tahoe. It'll be there in two days. Oh, I might have to take you up on that. Two to three days. Yeah. Yeah. It can't take too long because it's summer. So we pack it in ice uh, to keep it cool. Oh, for sure. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I feel you on the whole not drinking thing. I've, uh, stopped drinking in the past few years. And then I started drinking again. Um, and when I say stop, like, you know, maybe once or twice a month, like, you know, like slow down yeah. cons uh, quite a bit. And now I actually just a few days ago, it was up till four in the morning and, you know, tequila, vodka, I don't even know what else it was. It was like, I was back in college yeah. and <laughs> it was, it was bad. And I do not miss those days, but the way you're talking about Rosé, I've never really, I can't really remember Rosé much other than like the bag of Franzi and we had Tour de Franzi and it was like <laughs> slap the bag and yeah, like, yeah. I went to party school and did the whole thing. So, um, cool. Yeah, I like the intention behind it, though. Like, you know, it's TLC and it's the intention that goes into yeah. it. So that's really cool. Definitely going to check that out. Where uh, where did you go to school? Chico State. Oh, that's right. Chico State. Yeah, you said that. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, uh, you know, it's a woman's drink just by branding, um, obviously. But I just love it. I think a glass of rosé like once or twice a month with dinner. That's kind mm -hmm. of my cadence. I don't I'm not a big drinker, but when I do drink, I have a glass of rosé, chilled, especially on a summer night, um, and it's awesome. It's just a good vibe, man. And so we're 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 stoked. We're in a couple different bars and restaurants up in Santa Barbara, and we're slowly getting into a few other retail stores. It's a long, crazy process, especially because I'm a full time comedian doing production and all types of other things. But it's just it's nice to be able to put something else out there that I know will have, have the intention of creating moments of joy for people. Mm -hmm. Really what I want to do is just create 
as many opportunities as I can for people to smile and just like be with somebody else and be connected to somebody else. I love that. I think that's amazing. Well, good for you, Brent. That's, that's fucking awesome. I, I do love that genuinely. So guys, you can check it out in the show notes, vibe rosé, V-Y-B rosé.com. I'll put that in the show notes with the promo code vibrate with a Y as well for free shipping and yeah. all of Brent's uh, social media links, the video, maybe not all of your links, but you know, the main <laughs> ones will go in there and some of the all videos we talked about. Up everything. Yeah. Only fans, all the things. Yeah. yeah, totally. Well, Brent, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the pod. This was fun all over the place. Good getting to know you. Thank you for sharing a little bit on the inside of who you are, the guy behind these awesome videos. And thank you for how you show up in the world. Absolutely, brother. Thank you so much for having me on, man. I'm, I'm stoked to kick it in person next time I see you. Absolutely, brother. Thank you. Cool.